Zero Knowledge Proofs are powering the latest waves of innovation in the blockchain space. In this video, I'm going to give you a beginner's introduction to what Zero Knowledge Proofs are, what they accomplish, some examples of how they could be used in the real world, as well as dive into the technical differences between some popular types of Zero Knowledge Proofs used in things like the Polygon ZK EVM. This video will be helpful for you if you're interested in learning what Zero Knowledge Proofs are, how they really work at a high level and how they're used in the context of the blockchains like the Polygon ZK EVM. Without further ado, let's dive right into the details. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more content like this, like the video to help me out in the algorithm. Let's do it. So at the core of this, the overall goal of zero knowledge proofs or ZK proofs is to prove the validity of a statement without revealing the statement itself. And this process involves two key parties. The first of which is the prover and the second of which is the verifier. And hopefully these names are kind of self-explanatory. The prover is the party who's trying to prove the validity of a statement. They pass this in the format of a zero knowledge proof to the verifier. And the verifier is the one who's going to say whether or not the statement is actually true that the prover is making. A popular use case for this is in the context of identity. So in today's world or in SpongeBob's world, for example, and shout out to Steph for this awesome example. Her content will be linked in the description as well. The world of SpongeBob, he gets pulled over by this policeman or this police fish and he wants to prove some information about his identity. Let's say he wants to prove his name is SpongeBob. He wants to uh, prove his age or he's of legal, you know, legal age to be driving his car. What he has to do is hand over a ton of sensitive information like his license or his passport, which contains all of these facts about himself, like where he lives, what his full name is, what his date of birth is, all of this information that's not necessary to prove a given task to the verifier. So let's say in this scenario, the verifier wants to prove that SpongeBob is of legal age. SpongeBob is going to give away his license temporarily to the verifier. The verifier is gonna check, but at the same time, the verifier gets all of this kind of surrounding information that isn't necessary and that SpongeBob or a real person probably doesn't want to give away, right? I don't want someone else to know where I live. I don't want someone else to know my exact date of birth, right? So this is a real world use case where zero knowledge proofs are applicable. And zero knowledge proofs in this use case would mean rather than giving over all of that sensitive information, like our exact date of birth, where we live, how old we are, we would just send over a zero knowledge proof that satisfies the requirements of the verifier to say yes or no, what I want to know is either true or false. And none of this sensitive information is ever given away. And maybe just for some research on your own time, this is actually what this product called Polygon ID is building out, which maybe we'll have some further content on this channel later. In a kind of broad sense, there's two categories of zero knowledge proofs. And the first one is interactive, and the second one is non-interactive. So interactive proofs refer to the fact that these interactive proofs have multiple back and forth communications between the prover and the verifier. So it might go from prover to verifier to prover to verifier X number of times. Whereas non-interactive refers to zero knowledge proofs where only one single round of communication from prover to verifier is required. So there's only one kind of shot from prover to verifier and then a result or a conclusion is reached. So the interactivity of a zero knowledge proof refers to how much back and forth there is between the two parties that we've described so far, the prover and the verifier. So the first iterations of zero knowledge proofs were interactive, meaning they had multiple rounds of communication in order for the verifier to actually reach a conclusion. So the way that this works is a prover sends the verifier what's called a response and responses have two key components to them. They have a challenge and an answer to that challenge. So a stupid example, let's say a question or a challenge might be, am I drinking kombucha right now? And the answer I might provide you is yes. 
but maybe you don't know for 100% certainty that what I just showed you was kombucha, right? Maybe it was beer or maybe it was apple juice, right? And you want to kind of repeat these iterations to reach a level of certainty that, you know, you're mathematically comfortable with to say, yes, I am satisfied with the conclusion that I can reach a yes or no answer that the responses that the prover has provided actually prove that they know a piece of information. So the prover provides a response to the verifier, the verifier verifies it, says, yes, I'm satisfied with that or no, I'm not satisfied with that and then repeats this process because they're not 100% certain at this point in time whether or not they want to accept the prover's responses to reach a final conclusion. So it asks for a new challenge. So the prover says, here's the response to that new challenge the verifier provided and kind of repeats this cycle over and over and over again until the verifier finally reaches a point where it's received enough responses that it's satisfied with to make a final conclusion. A popular example of interactive proofs is the Alibaba cave story. So the situation is this. There's two characters here. One is this green looking guy here. So let's just call him Bob. And we have a pink character here. Let's just call her Alice. So the task is Alice wants to prove to Bob. So in this situation, Alice as the prover and Bob as the verifier, Alice wants to prove to Bob that she knows a secret passcode to open this gate that I'm kind of circling on the screen here. So this cave that she's going to enter has two entrances, one inside A and two inside B. So one entrance inside A and one entrance inside B. And these both kind of converge into this cave where a gate that requires a secret passcode to go through uh, kind of blocks the path, right? So Alice needs to know the secret path to complete this full circle through the cave. So Alice wants to prove to Bob that she knows the secret passcode without revealing the information. If you remember, that was kind of our, our definition of the zero knowledge proof at the start. She wants to prove that she knows information without revealing the information itself. So the secret passcode, she wants to prove to Bob that she knows it, doesn't want to give away. She doesn't want Bob to know the passcode, right? It's kind of a flex. Anyway, so the, here is step number two. So Alice in step one either goes through side A or side B. Step two, Bob is going to enter the cave. He has no knowledge of which side she entered through, but what he's gonna do is he's gonna say, hey, I want you to exit out either side A or side B. So you can see in this second screenshot example here, Alice has entered through side B, and in order to complete his task, she needs to utilize her secret code to exit out side A. And if I move my head over here, you can see that's what's happening in this third screenshot. So Alice uses a secret code to exit outside A. But you might be wondering, well, what if Alice entered through side A? She could have just exited out the same side and not actually utilize the secret information. And therefore Bob is thinking to himself, well, you did it once, right? You, you completed my challenge with a response containing the challenge and the answer once, but I'm still not certain that you know the secret passcode because in this situation, there was a 50-50 chance that you didn't even need to use that secret passcode, right? So Bob says, well, let's run it back. Let's do this again. And if we go back to our slide here, you can see we've done one iteration of this loop and verifier is like, well, hey, I know you did it once, but I want you to do it more. I want you to try this challenge, right? Try this variation of the challenge and see if she, Alice, really does have this secret passcode or does know this piece of information that she's trying to prove. So this process repeats itself. Alice completes the challenge once again, repeats itself. Alice completes the challenge once again, once again, once again, once again, until Bob is finally satisfied to say, okay, you've done it this many number of times. I'm finally satisfied that you have proven to me that you know a piece of information and Alice is happy because she's never having to give away the information that she doesn't want Bob to know. However, these interactive proofs, right? They're kind of the first iteration of these zero knowledge proofs, but the downside to it is first of all, they're unable 
unavailable, sorry, for independent verification. So this means if we go back to our slide, whoops, that's the wrong direction. If we go back to this slide, no one else was witness to this, right? <laughs> no one else saw that Alice completed this X number of times, right? Let's pretend Alice did this a thousand times. The only person that ever saw that and can that ever verify that this actually happened was Bob, right? I wasn't there. I don't believe Bob necessarily. I don't believe that Alice did this a thousand times. If I wanted to verify this information, I would have to do this all again. And I would have to stand here and ask Alice to do this a thousand times. So this is not necessarily that viable for blockchain use cases because we want blockchains to be transparent a lot of the time, right? We want people to, you know, be able to verify information by themselves and, and kind of have this distributed manner or decentralized manner. So that is kind of the downside number one. And then this kind of leads into the second point here where I said, this is not necessarily suitable for blockchains. As I said, we want blockchains to be transparent. We want this information to be verifiable by anyone. So this kind of led to the non-interactive zero knowledge proofs being made to address these kind of flaws. This leads us to non-interactive proofs. So non-interactive proofs, rather than having that cycle kind of diagram that we saw in the interactive proof slide, this is a one shot, single round of communication. So the prover provides a single response containing a challenge and an answer. The verifier verifies this response and immediately comes up with the conclusion of whether or not the prover has kind of satisfied their requirements. And the example that I love of this is Where's Waldo? And in Australia, we call it Where's Wally. I'm not sure where, where Wally or Waldo came from, wherever it is in your country. Essentially, if you don't know this game, your job is to find this character Wally or Waldo in this uh, picture here. So it's meant to be hard to find him. And let's pretend that I'm the prover in this scenario and you, the viewer, are the verifier. So using a non-interactive zero knowledge proof, I can prove to you in one go, one single round of communication that I know where he is without revealing where he is to you. So this again is coming back to that definition of the ZK proof. I wanna to prove to you without revealing the actual information itself. So given this kind of input on the left-hand side, I've taken a screenshot showing you that I found where he is, right? So I'm showing you here's kind of a challenge and an answer. Let's say, where is Waldo or where's Wally? And here's my answer. Here's where he is, right? I've proven to you that I know where he is, but I haven't given you any supportive information or any information of where he is, how I found him, or any kind of context to satisfy your yes or no answer immediately, right? Given this, you can say for certain, okay, well, Jared found him, right? Instantly, right? It's a one single round of communication. So that's the difference between non-interactive zero knowledge proofs is it's a single round of communication. So that's the difference between interactive and non-interactive zero knowledge proofs is the interactivity refers to how many rounds of communication there are between prover and verifier. So that leads us to the two most common types of zero knowledge proofs that are used in the context of blockchain. And those are ZK snarks and ZK starks. ZK snarks are smaller. So succinct refers to how small in actual size they are, making them quickly verifiable for a verifier to kind of accept as a succinct, a small zero knowledge proof take a look and verify whether or not it is valid. So that is a good thing about ZK Snarks. The kind of downsides to ZK Snarks are that it requires what's called a shared key, which is often called toxic waste. So during the initial setup phase of this kind of ZK Snarks system, a CRS, a common reference string is built by a kind of agreement made by both the prover and the verifier in the system. Anyone with access to this shared key can verify the proofs made in this specific system. So this is why it's called a trusted environment because in this kind of process, it's almost expected that these keys used to generate the CRS are actually discarded. So they need to be destroyed after the CRS is generated. So this is why it's called a trusted environment, which is seen as a downside because anyone who has access or 
if those values used to generate this key were not destroyed after it was generated. If people get a hold of those, they can actually compute zero knowledge proofs that are considered valid that are actually not valid, right? So it kind of breaks the whole system if these values are to get out because it allows anybody to come in and kind of produce results that are actually not true. The other small note here is that they're not considered quantum resistant. So since they are kind of small, they are considered uh, attackable by quantum computers, uh, which is kind of a threat that needs to be in the back of your mind in the future. And SNARKs use what's called elliptic curve pairing. I'll let you kind of research that on your own time. I'm probably not the qualified person to talk about these uh, specific mathematical topics in this video. So this leads us to ZK Starks, which instead of elliptic curve uses polynomials. Again, I'll let you research this in your own time as well. But what we're gonna talk about in this slide is the transparent. So all that stuff that we just talked about in SNARKs where it required that common reference string, that kind of ceremony at the start of the process and the destruction of those uh, shared keys in order to make this a safe and secure system, that process is not required in stocks. So that's why they're called transparent. There's no trusted environment. There's no risk of leaking those keys and being able to generate false zero knowledge proofs from the prover's perspective. They are also plausibly post quantum secure. So they're not going to be vulnerable in a world where we're all being attacked by quantum computers. However, the downside here is the scalable, which is the first S in ZK stocks scalable. So they're not as small in comparison to the snarks. However, they scale more efficiently when you're dealing with bigger data. And I thought this was a funny quote from Vitalik in one of his blog posts is he's quoted saying, the stocks are the newer, shinier cousin to ZK snarks. So to quickly summarize this, the snarks were smaller and therefore quickly verifiable, whereas stocks were kind of more scalable, but by default were much bigger than the snark comparison. In terms of security, the snarks required that trusted environment with the toxic waste whereas Starks completely avoided that initial setup process, making them arguably more secure. And Starks were also plausibly post-quantum secure. That is an absolute mouthful, whereas Snarks were not. So in kind of one sentence summary, Snarks, smaller, less secure, Starks, bigger, more secure. And I took this screenshot from Wikipedia just to kind of demonstrate that there are obviously many more different kinds of uh, zero knowledge proof systems and, and different variations of the stuff that we've talked about. Uh, if you're interested, I'll leave a link to where I took this screenshot from in the description and you can check it out for yourself. One small caveat to the things that we've just discussed is that there are these recent innovations. So you can see this post is as recent as earlier this year where the ZK snarks are being created that don't require this trusted environment. So this is a tweet from Jordi Bellina, who is the man leading the charge on the Polygon ZK EVM. And he talks about F Flonk, which is a ZK snark protocol like Groth 16 or Plonk with the following advantages and goes on to say this specific kind of ZK snark that is a succinct small zero knowledge proof does not require the specific trusted setup. So this is the actual final zero knowledge proof. If you watch my Polygon ZK EVM video, this is the final proof that gets posted back to Ethereum. So it kind of gets the best of both worlds where it is small in size and therefore saves significantly on the gas fees associated with posting that data to Ethereum while also getting the benefits of that kind of transparent environment. That's it for this video. I hope that was a nice introduction to zero knowledge proofs and how they're actually utilized in the ZK EVM. If you are interested in learning more specifically about the Polygon ZK EVM, I do have this video on my channel, which goes super deep into the Polygon ZK EVM and how it is utilizing these zero knowledge proofs to prove the validity of batches of transactions. With that said, Hope you enjoyed this one. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you did and like the video, leave a comment if you have any questions, I read them all. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.